I've, I've had this thing since I conducted a, a meeting just two weeks ago, uh, a minister's institute, and this thing struck me on the way home after that institute, and I haven't been able to get victory over it. Adam had sinned, and this whole beautiful thing that God wanted, it, it was all, uh, well, the ground, God had to curse the ground. We talk about man falling. Man didn't fall, he died. He died. He didn't just fall over, he died. And the day that you eat, you die, you die, and death passed into every part of our being and our mind became darkened and our spirit separated from God and we, we became heirs of Adam's sin as in Adam all die and we're heirs of his sin and his paralysis and the poison of sin that came into him. We are heir to all of that. But this magnificent thing that God has done has come down to us to correct all of that. Somebody said, what, what is the finished work of Jesus? The finished work of Jesus is to undo everything that Adam did. And when he came down, he came down for that purpose. As in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive, and to live by the life of God. And then he gives us an illustration of what he's doing in the story of creation, where creation from his hand was just beautiful. But then after Adam's sin, as I say, that the ground was cursed, and the beast, that, that curse, and the result of Adam's sin, because Adam, God put him in dominion over everything. So everything that was under his dominion came under his sin. And that's why even the little mosquitoes carry fever. And, uh, and all the insects want to bite you, and everything wants to get at you. The lions won't, they tear you to pieces if they could. And they're all saying, get back to God where you belong. And if you will get back to God, then we will be restored. All creation groans, waiting for man for the same deliverance that we experience in Jesus Christ. They all groan. That's, that's why we're having these awful storms that we're having. That's why we have these terrible earthquakes. That's why nothing in nature seems right today because all of nature is groaning, waiting. Mother Earth is groaning to bring forth a new earth. And all creation is groaning to bring forth another creation without sin and without all of this upheaval and uproar. You know there isn't anything in the world like it used to be. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Nothing. Nothing is like it used to be. And are you conscious of, are you conscious of heaviness that is settling down everywhere over us today? Are you conscious of that heaviness? Are you, is it, do you find it harder to pray than it ever was in your life? It's harder to pray. It, do you find it harder to hold on to standards that you used to have and things that you used to know? And, and blindness, the word says, is covering the earth and gross darkness. Darkness is covering the earth and gross darkness the people. And this awful blindness that came over man at Adam's sin that thing is being intensified. And the closer we get to the judgments of God that will be poured out on the earth, the more those things will be intensified in the earth. And this heaviness that you're conscious of in the atmosphere will get heavier. And the sleepiness, I go to the churches 
and there's such a sleepiness upon the people. Just they're they're asleep. They're just asleep, and they don't want to be disturbed out of their sleep. They don't want the kind of ministry that will arouse them and awaken them. They're enjoying their sleep, and they don't want sermons that bring conviction, and they don't want they don't want to be disturbed. The the five foolish virgins are sound asleep today. They're just asleep, and that sleepiness is settling down over Christianity, over the church, and over the people. Heaviness and darkness and confusion everywhere, everywhere. Every, every corporation on earth is in confusion. All the capital, every capital of every country is in confusion. Governments are in confusion. Banks are in confusion. Education is in confusion. Families are in confusion. And everything is being accelerated today as we get nearer and nearer the, the judgments that will be poured out on the earth and nearer and nearer the time of the coming of the Antichrist. This is the beginning of the Antichristal spirit that's settling down over the earth and settling down over Christianity and, and the churches the churches are in confusion, there's upheavals in places, and this will continue. This will continue, and the word says everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And you think you're having a hard time now, but the worst is yet to come. And it will get harder and harder as we get nearer the coming of the Lord. Because of the thing the devil is trying to do, his worst works are not with drugs. His worst works out there is not crime and all of that business. The worst thrust of the devil today is to try to keep the church of Jesus Christ from being raptured. He's trying to do everything in your life and in your family, in your personal life, to keep you from being raptured when Jesus comes. And these are some of the things that we're fighting today. These are some of the things that are in the air and in the atmosphere and all of this. And I've said before, when this thing levels out, the whole thing will be antichrist. It will be. That's the direction that it's going. But in the midst of all of this, God is building overcomers. If we, if we are conscious of this darkness and overcome the darkness, that's what he wants. That's what he wants. If we're conscious that the five foolish virgins are asleep and we see to it that we stay in the group of the five wise virgins, we don't have to go to sleep. We don't have to go to sleep. We don't have to become a victim of this antichristal spirit, a victim of the darkness today, a victim of the confusion. We don't have to come under this. We don't have to, and this is how overcomers are built. When we face things like this and stand before this situations to, to live in God, live in the new creation life. The new creation life is a marvelous life. You know, the Holy Spirit has supernatural intelligence. You know that? Say something. Amen. Yes, the Holy Spirit has supernatural intelligence. And the church baptized in the Holy Spirit doesn't need to be a victim of all of the things that the world is a victim of. You know, when during battles and wars, uh, victory is won when one side knows the secrets of what the other side is doing. And when they know their secrets, they know how to combat it and come against it and that's how battles are won and so the precious holy spirit has supernatural intelligence and he knows the tricks of the enemy and he knows his designs against you and against this fellowship and against your family he knows the designs of the enemy what he's trying to do out there and if you live in god and live in the holy ghost and live in the new creation, 
you can have the benefit of the supernatural intelligence of the precious Holy Spirit telling you how to meet the approach of the enemy and how to stand and overcome and not become a victim of the spirit of this age and the apostasy that the church is heading into. And the church is heading into the apostasy just as sure as we're here tonight, but we don't have to become a victim of that or a victim of anything else that the devil is doing. Live in the Spirit. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Live in the Holy Ghost. Walk with God. Live in the new creation life and accept what God allows in your life. And if you do, you will make the rapture and be in that company of overcomers. And that's what we really want, don't we? We want to be in that company of overcomers ready to meet the Lord. And he is he's getting his people ready for this. It's, it's just it's wonderful to, to, that God has made it possible for us. And then he lets us make choice. We, we, we live by choices, you know. And we, right now, every one of us are the sum total of the choices we have made in all of our life. That's what character is. We talk about nature and we talk about character. Well, what is my character? What is my character? Your character is the sum total of the, all the choices you've made in all of your life. Choices that we make register in us. And we haven't made just one choice in our life. We're making choices every single day. And every choice registers in our spirit. And what I am, what you are, is the sum total of all the choices we have made in our life. And we're continually making choices. The Lord has put us in this wonderful spot of of being a new creation and the old you isn't you anymore don't forget that say it the old you isn't you anymore not anymore and and when we when we came into this new creation we received the nature the nature of the one who made possible the new creation just like when we were born in the natural, every one of us received the nature of our parents. We received the nature of, of the parents who, who parented us. And it isn't hard for us to be like our parents. We're either like our mother or father, and maybe we're like both of them. But we, we are partakers of their nature. And of course, when we are born again, we are partaker of the nature of the one who parented us. And I love to think that my heavenly father fathered me. He fathered me. To me, that is a beautiful thought, that I am, I am fathered by God. Of course, I can call him father because I'm fathered by God. Isn't, I think that's a wonderful thing to realize that we are fathered, we're fathered by God. And so we receive in the new creation our Heavenly Father's nature. And that we have then these, the old, the old man still hangs around. We don't get rid of him. And the, we're, we, we live with these two natures in us. And here is where we are continually making choice who we're going to be and how we're going to live. And it's unfortunate to hear people say, well, I, this, this is the way I was born. This is me, and, and I'm like this, and this is, this is who I am, and this is the way I got born, and I can't help that I'm like this. And, and it's Christians who talk like this. The person who wrote the book, I Have to Be Me, won't get a goose egg of reward from God for writing such a book because I don't have to be me. 
I really don't have to. That's not, that's not gospel. That's not the word of God. And in, if I am a Christian, a Christian, in this new creation, we don't even want to talk about the old life. But uh, I hear this all the time. People will come to me and say, well, you will have to forgive me for this because I'm, uh, I'm strong-headed, I'm English. And I can say that because I come from that strain, from my parents way back there. But, but that's the old creation life. And we don't have to be bullheaded just because our parents and forefathers were English and were bullheaded and strongheaded. That's the old creation. And, but I, I can't help it. That's, I'm English and I can't help that. But I thought you were born again. And if you're born again, you have another nature and a new creation, and you don't have to be bullheaded. And that's, that's part of the old nature that God has to deal with, and we have to overcome that thing. We do not have to live in the old nature or be responsible for what our parents were or what we inherited. I always say this, there's so much of that today. Your parents were this, and you can't help that because you inherited this from your parents. All of that is in the old creation, and we are living, we're in the new creation, and yes, and you don't have to, to live on something that you think you inherited from the past. That's a terrible way to live. One church that I held a meeting in, the, the pianist, when he came in and sat down to piano, you knew where he was living, and you knew what kind of a day he had because he just played it out right away on that piano as soon as he came in, and he would beat out his tempers on that piano, just beat it out, and one night he beat the piano so hard he broke a string, and I thought we had gone far enough with this fellow. And so I spoke to the pastor about it, and I said, I think it's, it's time to deal with this fellow. And as soon as we approached him, he said, well, if you think I have a temper, you should meet my mother. And I said, I don't care to meet your mother. No, <laughs> no, no. And, and you don't have to live in that kind of a temper because your mother has that kind of a temper. We don't have to live in the old creation at all. And it's the old creation where all the works of the flesh are. And it's the works of the flesh that we have to overcome. And this is the area where we have to choose. And this is the area where the Lord lays on every one of our lives the cross to deal with all of that. And so we, 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 don't want to, we don't want to live in all of that. We want to live in, in our inherited nature from our Father. And we're in a different family. All the Joneses are like the Joneses. They all got the same nature. All the Browns are like the Browns. They all have that same nature. But you and I are born in the Lamb family. So we have the Lamb's nature. Say yes, yes. 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 We're, 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 we're all born into the lamb family, so we have the lamb's nature. And in this family, we are heirs of God. I love that. Romans, you'll find that in the 8th chapter of Romans, the 17th and 18th verse. I think it's so beautiful. The 16th verse says, The Spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Children of God. Born of God. Born of the Spirit. Born of, born of Christ. <coughs> Isn't that beautiful? Born of the Spirit. Born of God. Born of the Son. If we're children, then heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. 
And then I love his arithmetic, for I reckon that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Isn't that wonderful arithmetic? Praise the Lord. If we're children of God, then we're heirs of God, not heirs of the things of God. This, this, this is, you'll find in the, the singing book, it tells us that we're heir of a mansion, a harp and a crown, heirs of the things of God. But that's not what the Bible says. That's the gospel of the hymn book. But, <laughs> but the Bible says we're heirs of God. And to be heirs of God is, is very different. Heirs of God means we're heirs of the nature of God, heirs of his life, heirs of his likeness, heirs of his image, heirs of who God is, heirs of what God is. God just has given himself to us in his Son, and by the precious Holy Spirit, we are heirs of God. We can, we, we can eat him and drink him and receive of him and be nourished by him and be empowered by him and find all of our needs supplied in him. This is a wonderful thing, to be an heir of, of God himself. What is there in God that you would like? What is there in God that you would like to be like? What is there in you that you would like to exchange for what there is in God? This is our privilege. What is it in you that you don't like about yourself and you would love to get rid of in the old man and in the old nature? Well, the counterpart of that is in God, and it is given to us, and it's for us. It's for us. We do not have to live in the works of the flesh. If we walk, live in the flesh, we die. But if we live in the Spirit, we have what? Life everlasting, yes, everlasting. Oh, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ joint heirs with him if we're joint heirs with jesus christ think of think of who he is and what he is and what jesus offers to us everything in us says that we want to we want to be like him we want to belong to him we want to be where he is and he promises this Heir, joint heirs with Jesus Christ. And if we suffer with him, we will be glorified together with him. We're joint heirs of all that Jesus is, all that he is. We can have, we can have. It's, it's offered to us, it's given to us for the taking. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put off the works of the flesh. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. How do we do this? Well, he makes it possible and offers himself to us and tells us how this can be possible. And you'll have to turn for this to the 14th chapter of Luke. beginning with the 26th, 25th verse. And there were great multitudes with him. And he turned and said unto them, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doth not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Which of you intending to build a tower sitteth not down first and counts the cost, 
whether he have sufficient to finish it, lest happily after he hath laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king sitteth not down first and counteth whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him that cometh against him with 20,000, or else while the other is yet a great way off, he sendeth an ambassage and desireth conditions of peace. So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. You see, Jesus is, is the kind of lover that demands a hundred percent return. And this is, this is strong language when he says, you cannot be my disciple. Now, he's not asking us here to hate our mother, hate our father, hate your wife, hate your husband, and hate your brother and your sister. He's not asking that. But what he is saying that we are to hate everything, hate everything even in them, that he's talking here about things that involve the heart, heart relationships, and the heart relationships and emotional relationships are the hardest things in the world to deal with, and he knows that. So he goes right to the very heart of things and says, if, if, if there's anything in your mother that would keep you from following me, don't hate your mother, but hate that thing in her that would keep you, that would come between us and keep you from following me. Don't hate your husband, but hate that thing in him whether it be a spirit, whether it be a jealousy, whether it be a possessive thing, or whatever it is that would keep you from following me and doing my will, you will have to hate that thing. Hate it. Don't hate the person, but hate that spirit and hate that thing that would keep you from following me. Hate everything that would keep you from God's very best. Curse everything that refuses to yield to God in your life. Just just curse it. I, one night in one of the conferences, one, one of the ministers got, found a chair, and I saw him just beat the bottom of that chair and say, God, I just ask you to curse everything in me that will not yield to your holy will. I ask you to do that. And, and we must take that attitude not to allow one single thing in our life, in our mind, in our spirit, in our possessions, in our desires, in our interests, in any way, anything whatsoever that would hinder us from giving our all to Jesus and following him every step of the way. Curse, curse, Ask him to curse all rebellion, all resistance in you. And we don't know how much rebellion there is in us until he lays his hand on something in our life. Mm -hmm. We don't know our, we really don't know ourselves. But when he lays his finger on something in our life and we begin to pull back in spirit and don't want to meet that thing and don't want to face that thing, and don't want to make that surrender, don't want to give up, don't want to let go, don't want to do his will, don't want to meet that thing. That's, that's what he's talking about. Just hate everything in you that would in, keep you from following him. Every bit of rebellion, every bit of resistance, every bit of sin, every hard, carnal, unbroken, unbroken spirit, unforgiving spirit, anything between us and a friend or a neighbor or a relative or a, 
or a saint deal with every last thing and and see that Jesus reigns in every part of our life and being the choice is with us yes he will hear this this is the meaning of the cross that he's talking about if unless you take up your cross and follow me you cannot you cannot be where i am you cannot be my disciple but if if we will take up our cross and this this folks have a hard time understanding what is my cross i i've had folks i guess all over the country say would you please tell me what my cross is what is the cross and then they say jesus there's a teaching jesus died on the cross and he paid it all so i don't have anything to pay and i don't have to isn't that talk about false doctrine that's false doctrine all right that we that contradicts the teaching of jesus here there is a price to pay yes there is there is a death to die Honey, don't forget that there is a death to die. That old man has to die. Reckon yourself dead. And, and that's not physically, but that old nature in us. Reckon that old thing dead. Don't give place to it. Don't give place to it. Don't give way to it. Don't let it manifest itself. Just as soon as that old nature, that old carnal Thing, would like to lift its poisonous head for that's what it is it's full of death and just as soon as it manifests itself refuse it deny it curse it turn against it refuse it reckon it dead reckon it for what it is uh, suppose suppose that you you say i i have i have trouble with anger i can't control my anger i get angry well you know when that thing is beginning you know the very first approaches of it you know the very first thoughts you know the very in, first intimations of anger in your nature and just as soon as that thing shows its it's poisonous head you take a stand against it and say i know who you are i know what you would like to do to me and i i refuse you i refuse you you belong to the death you belong to the old nature and you will only minister death to me and i refuse you in jesus christ's name and don't yield to that anger and you don't have to yield to anger you don't have to yield to anger. Nobody has to sin. Nobody has to yield to sin. It's a choice. It's a choice that we make. And we, in the carnal mind, that thing is accepted. That thing is given place. And when it is given place in our mind, if you think about it long enough, it'll take root and, and you'll do it. Refuse to think about it and you won't do it. And Jesus knows, Jesus knows the things in us that need to be dealt with. Whosoever doth not take up his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Whosoever doth not. So it's a thing of the will. It's a thing of choice. And when he talks here about who would build a, a tower uh, you have to count the cost uh, whether or not you can finish this thing jesus has already he's the builder and he's already built his building he's all it's already built and in the mind the foreknowledge of god god knows everyone that's going to be in his building he knows and he has already paid the price for this building he counted the cost and at what cost jesus paid the price for his building at what cost he paid the price the king who went to battle for us and he won the war 
He defeated the devil. He defeated hell. He went to hell for us. And I just love him. He came out of hell and there wasn't he wasn't touched by it in any way whatsoever and he was so cleansed and so pure and so free from what hell would have done to him do you know Jesus never mentioned once that he had been to hell he never talked about it again do you know Jesus never talked about his crucifixion after his crucifixion he 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 went through his death so perfectly he went into that grave and was resurrected so perfectly he went to hell and was resurrected so perfectly he was untouched by demons and devils and death didn't do anything to him death didn't harm him he came out of it our risen resurrected lord with power all power in heaven and in earth is given unto me he rules and reigns over it all. Death didn't touch him. It didn't harm him. Hell didn't harm him. I think he's wonderful, don't you? Amen. I think he is so wonderful. And when I see him out there on the cross and what he went through on that cross for me, you know, it, it's beautiful. The main thing out there on Calvary it was between Jesus and his Father. Jesus wasn't... He, he looked on that mob that was crucifying him, and he said, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. But his main interest was not that crowd and what they were doing to him. His main interest was not that they were pushing spears into his flesh and putting nails through his hands and nailing him to a cross. That wasn't his main interest. Did you ever think of what was going on between Jesus and his father while he was hanging out there on the cross. One day the Holy Spirit began to talk to me about that. Jesus' only interest while he was hanging on that cross was his relationship to his father and that the father was pleased with what he was doing and that everything was all right between him and the father. The Father had sent him into the world to die. And he said, I came to do the will of him that sent me. My meat and my drink is to do the will of him that sent me. And now on the cross, his only interest is his relationship to the Father, that he's finishing the work the Father sent him to do. To me, that, that is a marvelous, marvelous thing marvelous and this is his choice he set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem and nobody or anything could t turn him back he finished the work that he was sent to do that's the finished work of Calvary he finished all that work that had to be done to redeem us from death to redeem us from hell to redeem us from the grave to, to heal our sicknesses, to forgive our sins, and to bring us back to himself that we could be glorified together with him. Praise his name. You know, he hasn't entered into his glory yet. Do you know that? Jesus hasn't gotten all the glory that is coming to him, and he won't enter into all of his glory until you and I get there. And I tell you, I want to be there when it happens. I want to be there. I want to be there when it happens, when he is crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. And we're there to really worship and praise and adore him and praise the Lamb for sinners slain, who still bears in his hands the prince of the nail wound. He's still the Lamb of God slain from before the foundation of the world. So he says to us, if you will come after me and we can be glorified together, there are some choices that you have to make too. And so here is a cross for you. And if you will pick up this cross and, and bear it and come after me, then you say, what is, what, what is my cross? Well, 
the cross the cross fits our will whatever what what the, we demand the cross that is laid on us whatever is necessary for to get rid of of our strong will you know some people's will is stronger than others don't you don't you yes and and whatever it takes in our life to crucify that strong will in us that's the type of cross that we demand we demand that and so he has to make that kind of cross for us and he asks us to take it up and come after him uh, people have said to me please would you tell me what my cross is and people people who ha have sicknesses sicknesses maybe terminal diseases or something like that they'll say I have to bear this cross honey that is not your cross that's not your cross Jesus said it's something that you voluntarily take up it isn't a disease is laid on you when would you voluntarily pick up disease <laughs> you nobody we rush to the hospital to get rid of it we turn to the doctor right away as soon as we get a headache and, and, and want to get rid of it. it. That's not your cross. And uh, what about mental trouble? No, that's not at your cross either. You didn't pick that up. You didn't choose that. What about the loss? Suppose I, I lose a lot of property uh, and, and this is a hard cross to bear. No, honey, that's not a cross. That's a very hard thing to bear, but that's not what Jesus is talking about. You didn't voluntarily pick that up. That was something that a tragedy that happened that we have to meet and we have to go through it. How we respond to all of these things builds character within us, how we, how we respond to things. But the cross is something that is laid on our life or brought into our life that I do not have to accept this. I do not have to pick this up. I don't have to do this. I can turn from it. I can free myself from this. I, I don't have to go through this. And, and, uh, and, and that's what the cross is. Now, I'll give you an illustration of, of something that I have been very close to. A friend of mine asked she knew that she knew in her life she did not love people she said i i just do not love people she was she was from a, a wealthy family and she had everything that she wanted and her husband just catered to her in every possible way and she says the the type of people that i like i want them to be educated I want them to be beautiful. I want them to be well dressed. I want them to be cultured. And if they have all these qualities, I can stand them. Otherwise, <laughs> otherwise, she says, I, I just do not love people and I can just let them go, just put them out of my life so fast. But she said one day the Lord began to deal with her about this because she knew that was in her nature and she knew that thing had to be dealt with and so she began to pray that the Lord would deal with this thing and would give her divine love I, I, I don't love people so I have to have divine love and, and this is the way God deals with us he gets rid of, the, of all those old things of the natural man and the flesh and puts in us the fruits of the spirit and here is where the cross comes in that the fruits of the spirit can be worked out in our life and those things of the old nature be crucified the cross is an instrument of death and the cross means crucifixion and when the cross that we will be asked to take up will crucify us it will be a thing of death it'll work death in us it'll crucify us and so my friend prayed the Lord would deal with this thing in her life 
and would give her divine love. Well, he, he dealt with it, all right. If we don't pray unless you mean it, because God answers prayer. And the Lord answered her prayer and sent into her home her mother-in-law. Now, now, this is a true mother-in-law story. It's really, really true. But I guess she loved her mother-in-law less than anybody else on earth. But she, she was not invited to her home, but she just sent her a telegram, and she says, Mamie, I feel that I would like to spend the winter with you and, and my son, and so I am arriving by train at such and such a time to spend the winter with you. And so my friend oh, went to her husband, <coughs> talked to him about it, and he said, I can do little about it. She's already on the train, and she's coming. We'll just have to meet her and bring her here. And <coughs> Mamie just <coughs> wasn't really welcome ready to welcome her at all but, the, but she came and when she came she, she asked her husband how long how long are you going to let her stay and he said well she says she has she's come for the winter so we will have to see what happens and she just took over my friend's home she just took over the home first thing she did the cleaning lady came in on friday and when she was in the kitchen and met her at the door. And this was the beginning of trouble. <laughs> the death process was on. <laughs> and the crucifixion had begun. And she just took over her house and told her what she could do and what she couldn't do, and how she should spend her son's money and things that she would allow and things she wouldn't allow, and what she could cook and what she shouldn't cook, and what she should feed her son, and what he needed and what she should do for him. And so my friend went to her bedroom, and she got down before the Lord, and she says, Oh, God, how long is she going to stay? And the Lord said, Well, you prayed for divine love, so she'll stay until divine love is worked out in you. Did you mean this? Did you mean, did you mean, he, she says, Lord, I don't love her, I don't love her. He said, well, do you want to love her? Do you want to love her? She'll stay until you love her. Uh, do you want her to stay? I can get rid of her. I can tell her to go. But if she goes, then, see, this thing continues in Mamie's life, and it's undealt with, and she's right back where she started from, and, and God has to arrange another circumstance to deal with this thing in her life. And so she, this woman got sick, and she was in bed, so now my friend Mamie had to take care of her, and she demanded that she bathe her, that she wash her feet, that she do this and this for and she did everything and another day she was in her room crying and so this woman went to the door and she says you've got your door closed you close your door in my face what are you doing in here she says I'm praying she says you need to pray <laughs> yes. and, and this thing lasted week after week she asked her husband to tell her to go home. No, he says, she's not going to stay forever. Can't we just let her stay a little longer? And someday she'll go. So Mamie said, oh, God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. God, help me. Well, she fought. She fought. She fought. And she fought. And inside of her, she was fighting. And she wasn't loving her. And the Lord kept saying, do you love her? I don't love her. I can't love her. How can you love her? <laughs> there isn't anything in her about her to love. And, and uh, so the Lord says, well, you prayed for divine love, and that's why she's here. 
I can send her away if you want me to. No, I do want you. I know I need this work done in me. And she said, Lord, don't let her go. And the day came when she started praying, will you please help me to love her? Because she realizes she's not going until this thing is worked out <laughs> in her life. And she started praying, Lord, please help me to love her. And this for work for another week. And one day she, the Lord said to her, can you today go and tell her that you love her? Oh, no, I can't do that. And another week went by. And he says, can you today tell her that you love her? She says, Lord, if you give me grace, I'll tell her today that I love her. And so that day she went to her and she says, her name, I forgot her name, but she says, I just came over to tell you that I love you. And the, she got all flustered and she didn't know what to do with that because she knew what she had been doing to her. Of course she knew what she was doing. She knew she was killing her. She was just crucifying her. She knew that. But she got all upset when Mamie told her, I love you. And uh, after, before the day was over, she says, Mamie, I just decided that I'll, I'm going to pack my trunk today and I'll be leaving you in two days. And so in two days she packed her trunk and left and Mamie had this, God had worked this love in her heart and in her life that she really did love her. Now she could have gotten rid of her her husband could have sent her away. She just did not have to go through that, but she chose to have divine love worked out in her life, so she chose to take up that cross and let this woman do this thing to her. So after two days, she went away to work on somebody else. <laughs> but but that that is the type of thing that is the cross. It's something that you you don't have to go through. Something that you could lay down if you wanted to, if you chose. But if we're honest with ourselves and really want God in our life, it may not be that drastic and it won't last that long if we surrender to the cross and let the Lord deal with us. But if we don't surrender to it and let him deal with it in this circumstance, then he'll have to arrange another circumstance. So we may as well go through it the first time, and we may as well go through it right if we're honest and sincere in our life and want God's very best. But can't you see it's an eternal loss if we do not take up our cross, if we do not pay the price, if we do not let the Lord deal with us in, in all of these things, anger, <coughs> anger, jealousy, 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 the Bible says is as cruel as the grave and he has to deal with us. And I could tell you stories about jealousy, hatred, real hatred and unforgiving spirits you know unforgiving spirits how god has to deal and god prepares the circumstance somebody says will the lord prepare the cross and bring it to you well he prepares the circumstance and we know what is after in our lives every one of us if we're going if we're walking with god Every one of us, there's something in us to be crucified and marked by the cross as long as we live. And when we get rid of one thing, God takes on the next thing. And, but there's always something in us. None of us are perfect yet. A anybody says they have reached that place, I'd say, you're not telling the truth because nobody is perfect soon as we're perfect the lord will take us home but none of us and as long as we live there's something more in us to be marked by the cross and every one of us right now if we're honest we know what god is dealing with us about we know where he's working in our life we know what in us is not like him the, this in this area of my life 
I'm not truly Christ-like, and God wants to change this area of my life and, and, uh, and put in there the disposition of Jesus instead of my disposition in this thing. Somebody asked me, well, could, could a rotten disposition be my cross? I uh, know that's not your cross, that's the cross the person has to live with. Me. <laughs> and folks folks will say, Why why did God let me be born with such a disposition? Honey, God didn't sit up at night and say, Now I'm gonna give her this kind of disposition. No, sin has done this to us. God didn't do it, but sin, whatever in us has to be dealt with, sin has done this thing to us. And we just woke up with it, and here we are with this old creation and this carnal thing that has to be dealt with. But God help us to deal with it, because he says, unless you do, unless you take up your cross, take up your cross and follow me, you cannot be my disciple. You can't come with me where I am, that we will be glorified together. That doesn't mean you won't get to heaven. He's not talking about that. <coughs> we'll get to heaven, but you can get to heaven and miss an awful lot, even though you're inside the gate. There's more to heaven than just getting there. There's all these different positions positions and relationships to Jesus that demand character qualities in us. And that's what he's building in us, the character qualities of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is what he wants in us. And there are certain quality characters that demand, that's demanded of us for certain positions. To get to heaven is one thing, but but where we will be in relationship to Jesus, that's a different thing entirely. Our works are one thing. We'll be rewarded for our works. We'll be rewarded for our works. But our position in heaven depends on how much of Jesus Christ is worked out in us. And the Bible, 15th of 1 Corinthians says we'll come up in the resurrection or in the rapture, every man in his own order. So if we're still infants, we'll be in the infant class. Whatever grade of character quality we allow Jesus to be developed to in us, that's the company that we will be in throughout the countless ages of eternity. That will be our station and our position. So it's, it, it, there's every reason why we should pay the price, pay the price, die the death, give up everything, go through with Jesus Christ, say yes to everything that he lays his hand on, and be grateful to God for everything that he deals with us about. Amen? Amen. Yes, don't resist the Spirit. Don't resist conviction. <clears throat> Praise God for every bit of conviction that he gives you. I don't like to be under conviction. It's terrible to be under conviction, but I thank God for conviction. Uh, when he lays his finger on something and deals with us about it, we know what he's saying. We know what he wants. We know what he's dealing with. We know what he means. And so, and he gives us the ability and his precious Holy Spirit in us is the power and the enablement to pay the price and go through with him. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, he, he tells us to take up our cross and deny ourself. To, de to deny ourself is different than denying things. We give up this and give up that and give up. We can give up things and, and just retain the old nature and the old self and our personal life not be touched. But he doesn't, he's not talking about giving up things. He deny yourself. 
deny yourself, deny yourself, the old self, the old carnal life, and let him, let him bring us through to the victory that he desires in our life. Praise the Lord. The sweet, I have a note here, the sweet, clean breath of God broods over the new creation constantly to bring it into the full will of God. I like that. So I, I made that special note. The Spirit of God brooding over us like he brooded over creation. Yes, after the, after the fall, and it says the Spirit of God brooded over the waters and, and, and God began to bring forth another creation. And the Spirit of God broods over us to bring through in your life and my life the perfect will of God. And when he get in, we get in his presence, every one of us will have to testify God was faithful to us. God did everything on his part. He convicted, he dealt with us, he talked to us. He did everything on his part. Now it's up to us to choose, to choose. If, if we will with God, he'll bring us through. But if we don't surrender to his will, as I said yesterday morning, then God has to surrender to our will and let us have our way. And that means death, eternal death. And that's an awful price to pay, isn't it? That's the greater price when we, when we don't yield to him and let him have his way. All right, does anybody have any questions on what I have said? Yes. I've got to figure out how to phrase this, or maybe it's a twofold question. Where is the fine line or the line between our striving and our and the strength of God in overcoming? And how can we tell whether we're just striving in ourselves to try to overcome something or, or something, or we're giving it to God? Well, <clears throat> that's a good question. <clears throat> That's a very good question, and I'll show you an example in the life of Jesus. If we follow the Lamb whithersoever we goeth, or if we come after him, as he said, we know there's going to be a Gethsemane in our life. That's part of coming after him. And <clears throat> he had his Gethsemane where he made that surrender. He knew Calvary was out there ahead of him. Yeah, but he really made the full surrender in Gethsemane. He, he committed Calvary to God. He made the surrender. He prayed through in Gethsemane until there was nothing left but the will of God. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. But even though he had prayed that through and made the surrender of Calvary, he still had to go to the cross. He still had to go out there and pay the price, even though he had made the surrender. And when we, we, we surrender something in our life that we know is there, we bring it to Jesus and surrender it to him, he will... He will create a condition or a circumstance to work that thing out in, in your life and bring it to its crucifixion. Even though you surrendered it, you still have to go through the crucifixion to get rid of that thing in your life. You have to go through the experience. <coughs> Make the surrender, but don't take back what you have surrendered. That's where, trouble, where people make a mistake. They, they give things to God and then take it back and, and let it be manifest again. I had an a organist in, in a church that I was, I was associate pastor in that church, and this organist had one of the worst dispositions I've ever met. And she would come to me and she'd say, I, now, and she had trouble at work all the time with that disposition. Of course, she would have trouble. 
and she said, I've given my disposition to the Lord. I surrendered it to him. I gave it to him. But I go back to work the next day and the same thing happens. Well, she she surrendered. She gave her disposition to the Lord. But when when the time of choosing came, she went back into the old creation and didn't take the victory that was hers in Christ Jesus to meet that thing and overcome it. And and that's that's where we don't strive, we surrender. And when we surrender the thing that he's talking to us about, then when we meet it again, we have to call it by its name and face it and refuse to yield to it and, and take the victory of Jesus and let him live his life through us. Call it by its name, whatever it is. Adam named all the beasts in the garden. Adam gave them a name. He, he called the wolf a wolf because it had a wolf nature. He called the lion a lion because it had a lion nature. Whatever the, that animal had, Adam called it, gave it its name because that was its nature. And that's the name it bore. And he had dominion over it. So what, whatever you're facing, Call it by its right name, but then when you have to, the temptation comes or the circumstance comes that you have to meet that thing, that's the time to make the choice and not let it have any manifestation in your life whatsoever, but take the victory of Jesus. And let Jesus live the new creation life instead of the old man manifesting himself. Does that answer your question? All right. Anybody else have a question? Yes, honey. Um, you said that um, circumstances or things that happen to us that we um, can't control are not the cross in our lives, like, you know, like loss or illness or something. But, um, doesn't God use those things to deal with? Honey, he, yes, he uses those things to build character in us. Mm -hmm. Yes, how those things, all circumstances and people and sickness and sorrows and happy days and bad days and good days and all of that, we make choices in the, in the presence of all that and, and our reaction to those things that's that's how character is built in us. Does that answer? Yeah. <laughs> yes, God uses everything, everything in our life. God uses to, uh, and in the f in the face of everything, it's how we react to it. You know how we react to what God allows in our life. God uses that to work, to build character in us. Yes? You said uh, when we don't yield to him, it means death. Do you mean it, it means death in developing more of Christ within us? Yes. Yes. Yes? So that would be considered the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus, that creation life. Yes. That's that energy that once we yield, it's a law, it's fixed. Yes. And that automatically sets us free yes. from that sin and death. Yes. The law of sin and death, I spoke on that yesterday morning. The law of sin and death was when God said to Adam, the day you eat thereof, you die. That's sin. You see, if he sinned, death was a result. But there's another law, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. This is the new creation life that's in us, so we don't have to yield to the old life, but the new life in Christ. Oh, I hope, I hope you see the importance of living the new creation life and how blessed we are to to be full of Christ and have his life and ability and strength and power 
and he's in us all that we need to meet anything, no matter what it is, the life of Christ, the power of God in us. God's bigger than hell. God's bigger than the devil. God's bigger than flesh. Amen? Amen. Yes. And let him live the overcoming life in us, through us. Why, why is it that some people find it more difficult to choose to, to live in that life? You know, I know there's people, and even in myself, there's times where I just say it's just so hard to make, you know, it's a simple choice, you know, A or B. Why can't we just choose? Why isn't that choice so easy? Well, well, honey, I'll have to... Can I ask you a question? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Why is it always <laughs> <laughs> No, no. You see... Go ahead, ask me. I asked you a question. Well, this, this is the answer to why is it easier for some people than others. It, it goes back to how much time do we spend in prayer? That's where we get our strength. That's where we get our power. That's where we that's where God can put his spirit in us and put his strength in us and we come from the place of prayer. We can face things, we can meet things, we have strength to say yes or strength. Sometimes it's no. We it takes as much strength to say no as to say yes sometimes. <coughs> and how much, how much time do we spend in prayer? And this is, this is a loss in the life of most Christians. And when people come, I would never have to leave my house for ministry. There's people there all the time for counseling. And nine times out of ten, I will say, how much time do you spend in prayer? And I always get this answer. Well, I know not enough, not enough. My, I have a weak prayer life. If you have a weak prayer life, you're going to be a weak Christian. If you have a strong prayer life, you'll be a strong Christian. And we will have strength in our life to meet the devil, to meet sin, to meet temptation, to meet the old nature, to meet the old man. We must, we must pray more must give ourselves to prayer. And this day that we're living in demands lots of prayer, lots of prayer. Pray, spend as much time as possible in the presence of God in prayer. And then, as I said a while ago, some people's will, we know some people have a stronger will than others. And of course, those strong wills God has to deal with, to break those strong wills. And, yes, and that resistance against God, that resentment against God, a rebellion against God, that's, it's harder for people with strong wills, determined to have their own way. Honey, I didn't mean to point you out no, that you weren't. No, I, I almost knew you were going to say that anyway. The so. <laughs> <laughs> Lord's been dealing with me on this issue. Uh -huh. Prayer, yes, prayer. We must pray. We must pray. All right, anybody else? Yes, dear. I have a major struggle in my life. <laughs> and my struggle is being able to tell when it's the Lord telling me something or when it's my feelings pushing me. And I mean, and certain people can tell you that I am, a, when it comes to making decisions, it's very hard for me because I always wrestle with, well, is it God's will or is it my feelings telling me what to do? I mean, is there any way to be able to somehow discern between what God's telling me and what I'm just, my feelings are telling me or whatever? Yes, well, the Word of God is our guide very largely in the things of the will of God. And anything that 
We, if we want to know the will of God, God says if any man wants to know his will, he can know it. Ask of me for wisdom. He'll give you wisdom. He'll let you know. He'll let you know. And um, the word of the Lord is sure. We can trust it. And it's there on, on just every subject that you would want to deal with. So just stay in the Word of God, and then you won't be confused or deceived if you stay in the Word of God. And in these days, it's very important that we stay in the will of, will of God. Just eat it. Just fill our hearts and minds and spirits with the Word of God. Yes. Could I ask you to clarify something? Uh, not only for me, someone asked a question of me um, since Sunday. Um, when you made a statement that when um, at the end of our life, when we're presented to the Father, that you said all that the Lord has worked in us, that the Lord <coughs> himself, that Jesus in us, will be the only thing that will be presented to the Father. Um, someone had said to me, it sounded like what you were saying, that the essence of who we are would cease to exist, and only that seed that was planted in us would be presented to the Father. You see what, yes. what this person was saying? Yes. Well, the, the, that seed that's planted in us wants to fill the whole house. Mm -hmm. And Christ just takes over our spirit. Christ takes over our mind. Christ takes over our nature. And, and Christ takes over all that we are until he wants us to be become Christ and then and then that what Christ has been able to work out in us in our nature in our spirit in every part of our being that's who we are that's that's all that will go because that's all that can really fellowship the father and the son yes but um Still, you would maintain your you maintain your, own person. your personality. Right. Your personality. But he's developed within your personality. Yes. As far as yes. possible, as far as you allow him. To. As far as we allow him to. But yeah. That doesn't mean that God's only going to see Christ. J or Christ Adam or Christ, you know what I'm saying. He's seeing you as a person. Yes, but that but with yeah. Christ's characteristics and your own personality. Yes. Yes, Christ takes over the whole life. That's what he wants to fill the whole <coughs> life and being with himself. Yes. It, when Christ came out of the grave, it was they saw the Christ that they saw go in the grave. And when we come up out of the grave and when we are raptured, what only what of Christ has been etched on our spirits and worked out in our personality. That's that's who we are and that's what we'll go and that's the company we will be with. Yes, my brother. Uh, speaking of the will of God, uh, in the case of King Solomon, the Lord told him, anything you want, I'll give you. Yes. That was God's will. Yes. In my own life, I've desired things that God gave me. Yes. That I could have got along without. Yes. And if I don't go overboard, many times he gives me desires that, of something I would like, some way or some, even some possession. Yes. Well, he says he he will give us the desires of our heart, but he puts those desires in us. Yeah. So we're we're safe. 
when, when he, what we, if we're his child, he gives the desires. So and we're saying, yeah, yes, yeah. So he does, he does give all of us more than we deserve. He's a good God. He's a good God. He is so faithful and so wonderful. I have no complaints about my heavenly Father and his care of me. He's so wonderful. Don't you think so? Yes. Praise the Lord. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was wondering, um, since we, we have this old nature, right? <coughs> I guess um, we have these tendencies that God deals with. Is there ever a place where, um, like, he conquers it? Like, like, say there's an area in your life. That we, does it come to a place where it's conquered, where... It's not a problem or... Yeah, that's what we call overcoming, honey. Yeah, but I mean, it, uh, since we ha always have these natures with us, yeah. are we going to be always dealt with in the same, like, area because we have that tendency, like, well, until we die, or is there a place where the Lord just conquers it? Well, like, he yes, yes, away. he wants to conquer like, that. Mm -hmm. He wants to conquer that one thing. And when he conquers that one thing and that's over, cheer up, he'll start on something else. <laughs> then he starts on the next thing. But there will, as long as we're in this life, there will always be something in us that he'll deal with. What I mean is like, like it says to keep your heart with all diligence. Yes. Does that mean like, okay, we know what tendencies we have? So we always have to be guarded in those areas? Yes, yes, okay. yes. Good girl. <laughs> You're all right. Praise the Lord. Well, did you get anything today? Amen. Shall we stand? I think we ought to sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow.